unique American experience. A game described by one turn-of-the-century critic as crude and barbaric, with little chance of survival. But survive, it did. Super Bowl program! In Pasadena, California, where today they're expecting a record Super Bowl crowd of more than 100,000. Thousands of men have shared in its growth, and many have played leading roles. Everybody grabbing out there, nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. This is a story of mighty men and magic moments, from the individual brilliance of Jim Brown to the special team magic of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Bradshaw running out of the pocket, looking for somebody to throw to, fires it downfield. And there's a collision. That's, got, that's caught out of the air. The ball is pulled in by Franco Harris. Harris is going for a touchdown for Pittsburgh. Harris is going. Franco Harris pulled in the football. It's a story about larger-than-life legends, such as Hall of Fame linebacker Dick Butkus, whose ferocious style of play left a lasting impression. He was the meanest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life play professional football. He didn't like anybody with a different color jersey. I mean, he really disliked you. It's a story that spans the life of the game's founding father, George Hallis, a man who coached the Galloping Ghost in the Roaring Twenties and the Kansas Comet four decades later, who cherishes every moment in between. Just being a part of the growth of the National Football League, that to me is the greatest thrill or event in my life. Pro football was not a full-time profession for the pioneers. They worked in the mines and mills of Pennsylvania and Ohio by day, practiced at night, and played games on their day off. The pioneers of the pro game played for fun and for the pride of their village. Their curious appearance belied a style of play that was as innovative and entertaining then as it is today. From this modest beginning, the game moved in fits and starts for some 50 years. That pro football persisted and grew is largely due to the men in the funny outfits, men who would scarcely recognize the look of their game as it's played today. Pro football has evolved from back lots to big cities and into temperature control palaces in the suburbs. The players of the 1980s may be bigger and quicker, stronger and faster than their forefathers, but no matter how you line up the teams, there are still 11 men on a side and the fundamentals remain the same. Today, professional football is played in the nation's largest cities. But at the turn of the century, the roots of the game took hold in rural America where small-town rivalries were the lifeblood of the early pro game. The fiercest rivalry of all was contested in the shadow of the Ohio Hospital for the Insane. The rivals were the Canton Bulldogs and the Massillon Tigers. 
It wasn't until 1920 that Ralph Hay, owner of the Canton Bulldogs, arranged a meeting to interest investors in forming a league. Yes, this meeting in Canton on September 17th was held in the Hupmobile showroom uh, in his automobile agency. And of course, there weren't enough, uh, enough chairs for everybody, so they, we sat around uh, on the uh, running boards of the Hupmobile cars. And in order to join this group, you had to put up a hundred dollars for a franchise. I think it's worth a little more than that now. But I, there was never a doubt as to what type of game we had. Despite its new name, the National Football League operated on a casual basis and teams popped up and died from year to year. What the sport needed was a drawing card. In 1925, it got just that. George Haller signed Red Grange, the Galloping Ghost, and the Chicago Bears toured the country and capitalized on his name. But the prosperity Grange brought the Bears was short-lived. Professional football still lacked structure. One man alone could not make the game. Enter George Preston Marshall, the owner of the Washington Redskins, the master showman who introduced halftime shows, a team song, and a marching band. Most important, Marshall suggested that the league be divided into two divisions, with the division champions meeting for a world title. While George Preston Marshall provided structure for the NFL, a rotund man from Philadelphia provided leadership and stability. That man was Burt Bell. Well, you know, there always seems to be men for the times. Burt Bell as commissioner in the late 40s and the early 50s was ideally suited. He had a great rapport at an informal level with the media. He could relate to players. He was a rough-talking, man's man type of a guy that during those growing years could be a tough disciplinarian or he, he could roll with the punches. The fact of the matter is I don't know who could possibly win this race, I believe that if any team that wins eight and loses four will certainly win the championship of their conference, or at least they will tie it. Bell equalized the league's talent through the player draft. Still, there were empty seats. Bell then proposed to bring his game to the people through television. In the 1950s, professional wrestling was television's number one live action show. Burt Bell was the first to recognize that television could be a tremendous vehicle for pro football as well. I think the, the single most conducive factor to, to building up our game was the 1958 season in New York. The build-up in New York was unbelievable, and we're the seat of, of uh, most of the national media, the advertising agencies, the sponsors. And uh, I don't go to cocktail parties much, but the people who did go to them said that the only topic of conversation in any party in New York or any uh, uh, gathering of any kind was and so on. When 50 million TV viewers saw the Baltimore Colts win the 58 championship game in sudden death overtime, the theater of pro football opened for a long run. When the game was over, it came out of that second deck press box in Yankee Stadium, and there was Burt Bell. Burt was crying, and it was unusual to see, always tough to see a grown man cry. Burt was probably in his 60s, early 60s, and he said, John, and I never forgot what he said, I never thought I would live to see sudden death. Burt Bell, the man, was a, as unpretentious as any great figure I've ever met in American sports. And he loved football so much that he gave his life for the game and he actually died at Franklin Field. In 1960, the league moved its headquarters from Philadelphia to New York, where a new commissioner realized the value of television. The biggest reason for the, for the growth of pro football would have to be television. Uh, it made a tremendous economic change 
it meant that the teams could uh, uh, would be stabilized in their communities. We'd had, I think, 44 franchises fold or shift over the years until, until the big television occurred. It made us more of a national sport. I never thought I would see the day when our championship game would get over 100 million viewers. In 1969, television trained its eye on the rival American Football League as Joe Namath led the New York Jets to a Super Bowl win over the Colts of the established NFL. A year later, the two leagues merged. Today, 28 teams compete for the Vince Lombardi Trophy, and the Super Bowl has become an international event. It is Super Bowl XI. This 11th Super Bowl will be viewed in 41 nations around the world. Desde el Tazón de las Rosas en Pasadena, California, los Raiders de Oakland y Vikingos de Minnesota. Se the Raiders d'Ocean, champion de la Conférence Américaine, et les Vikings de Minnesota, champion de la Conférence Nationale. Oakland Raiders. C'est la confrontation tant attendue entre Ken Stabler des Raiders et Francis Tarkenton des Vikings. Francis back to pass, throw the sideline, picked up! It's going to be a touchdown! Willie Brown! He's going all the way! Since that first game in Latrobe, Pennsylvania in 1895, professional football has evolved through 87 years. That the game remains essentially the same is a salute to the founding fathers who nursed the pro game as it grew and who gave it the backbone it needed to carve out a lasting place in American sport. Enshrined here in Pro Football's Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, are the legends of the game, larger than life figures who helped the sport capture the public's imagination. You know, the fans have always been fascinated by players with special images to match their special talents. The Golden Boys, the Glamour Boys, the Broadway Joes, the folk heroes who sometimes made headlines off the field as well as on, and sometimes not to our own liking. But it even goes back to the 1920s, the days of the Roaring Twenties, if you will, because it was then that one man out of Illinois, he wore the number 77, his nickname, the Galloping Ghost, he was Red Grange, for it was in 1925 when Red signed with the Chicago Bears that he threw the NFL into the national spotlight. The movies may have had Douglas Fairbanks, but pro football had Red Grange. Like Dashing Doug, Grange's name meant big box office. But Grange would discover that his was by no means a household name, especially around the number one household in America. I remember my first trip to Washington, D.C. Senator McKinley uh, called George Hallis and myself and invited us to go to the White House. And the senator introduced us as George Hallis and Red Grange with the Chicago Bears. And I remember President Calvin Coolidge's remark. He said, young man, I'm glad to know you. He said, I always like animal acts. I've said many times that probably I would have been uh, thought more of had I joined the Capone mob in Chicago instead of professional football. By 1950, the NFL's marquee value had increased, and in Los Angeles, the Rams featured a star-studded cast headed by Elroy Hirsch and Bob Waterfield, who nearly relinquished the spotlight to his actress wife, Jane Russell. He wouldn't sign with anybody, you know. He wouldn't, didn't want to know, no pro football for him. So I said, Bab, you can go on through the rest of your life and be, be known as Jane Russell's husband. I said, she's made a great name for herself. You can do the same thing in football, and you can be so good in football that Jane Russell will be, be known as Bob Waterfield's wife. Number seven, Waterfield set the tempo for a swinging, swaying offense. His favorite target was Hirsch, number 40, who in 1951 averaged almost 50 yards on each of his 17 touchdown catches. This receiver with the juking, jitter-bugging style was known as Crazy Legs. Waterfield crosses the nifty aerial to Crazy Legs, Hirsch, Elroy's change of pace. Completely baffles Ray Palfrey, and over he robs 
to complete a 72-yard touchdown. Hirsch's vast popularity led to a movie career. But during the 50s, there was another folk hero who the public scarcely knew. His name was Hardy Brown. Like Paul Bunyan, Brown was a legend among his peers. Hardy Brown was a legend, I would say, because of a technique he used. He played defense. He was a linebacker. And he had a knack of using his shoulder pad when he'd get to a ball carrier. And just like somebody use a karate chop, he could time that thing out and leverage that shoulder right up into the man and take him down or catch him around the head with it if the man was kind of bucking through the line or going through. And he'd come up there and he'd level him with that shoulder. Hardy was a type of player that, that really didn't go in with his arms and try to tackle you. He just went in there to hit you with the shoulder. The incident I remember most about Hardy Brown was a time in our game that one of their defensive backs intercepted a pass and he came back and hit Bill Swiacki on a comeback block, and he hit him so hard, I thought that he'd killed him. Brown's shoulder was a lethal weapon during a time when pro football was as wild and woolly as the untamed frontier. Every game was like a showdown at high noon. You see these westerns, you see guys have niches on their belts for guys they'd killed. Well, Hardy Brown had niches on his belt for all the jock straps he got. He put more people to sleep with a shoulder lick than anybody I've ever seen. I've seen Hardy Brown knock the helmet right off a player. Hit him in the chest, chin, boom. His, the, the player's feet would continue down. You would see him come running like this player up in the air, helmet off, and just spread eagle. Every time we'd play the Chicago Bears, Hallis would have the officials come in and inspect Hardy. Always thought he had a steel plate or something up on his shoulder pad. It was kind of like a Jack Dempsey punch. It didn't need but six inches. That's all it needed, and you went to sleep. One time in San Francisco, Hardy Brown had 21 knockouts. He, he knocked the entire starting backfield of a team out. These aren't exaggerations. These are true, uh, truisms. The recollections of old pros are the main source for the exploits of the Bunyan-esque Brown. But by the 60s, pro football had become mass spectacle, and the fame of Bears linebacker Dick Butkus, number 51, grew under the spellbound gaze of millions. For nine seasons, Butkus played with a bloody rage worthy of a Hollywood horror show. I don't go to the movies too often, but uh, one particular movie that stands out in mind uh, was uh, with Betty Davis. I think it was Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. I got a kind of a charge when that head come rolling down the stairs. I kind of like to, to sit there and watch it and uh, see things happen and maybe uh, project those things happening on a football field and not to me. Butkus instilled in his foes a raw, primal fear. And for some, the image of this swooping monster still terrifies. Is there a place to hide around here? Dick Buckus Christ. He is, the, he is the only guy that's ever, I guess, intimidated me on a football field. He was the meanest son of a bitch I've ever seen in my life play professional football. He didn't like anybody with a different colored jersey. I mean, he really disliked you. You know, he, he went after you like he... He hated you from his old neighborhood. He would engulf you and, and, and try to break your neck on the way down. Butkus was the best football player I've ever played against. The guy never missed you. He was just a great, great football player. I never saw a guy play the game more intensely than Dick. If there's a devil, it is, there's a heaven and a hell, and there's a devil to a running back, this was Satan. Dick Buckus was pro football's satanic majesty, but the game's royalty also included men of angelic bearing. Paul Horning and Frank Gifford embodied their era's sophisticated cool. These were two supremely versatile halfbacks for championship teams. Number 16, Gifford of the 50s Giants, and Horning, number 5 of the 60s Packers. Horning also played hard off the field, and once his playboy exploits provided the material for a pep talk he gave his teammates. 
It was tough to get the Packers up. You know, we were in California, and I could just sense the guys were very, very tight, you know, and they were just, you know, a little even nervous. And I got up and I said, look, gang, I said, I'm not going to give a great speech or anything. I came out here from Fort Raleigh, Kansas, where I was stationed and I, as a private in the Army. I came out here for two things. I said, I took care of the first thing last night, and I let's go out and beat the, beat the 49ers. There was a great roar, and everybody kind of just laughed and, you know, had a, had a kind of a joke, and they relaxed it. And, of course, Lombardi was going berserk in the other room. The Golden Boys' nonstop search for fun made scintillating copy. It's a lot easier to write about a halfback who scores touchdowns, who's single, and, and, and likes the ladies. It's, you, you, there's not much to write about an offensive tackle who's married and has three kids, and if he does fool around on the road, he don't want anybody to know about it. So the writers are naturally going to go to your, your single-type football players who've got a little bit more color anyway. In 1965, Manhattan became the personal playground of the most colorful player of them all. When Joe Willie Namath joined the Jets, he brought sex appeal to the NFL. They tabbed him Broadway Joe for his forays into the neon night world of New York City. Sometimes they talk about drinking and conniving around with ladies and stuff. And, you know, it seems almost un-American to me for a bachelor not to, marry, you know, go around uh, having a drink with a lady now and then. And how, why all of a sudden that's become an evil in me, uh, I don't know. But some people don't like it. Well, you can't please any, everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, trying to get along, you know, just, just trying to get by. Look at that shot. Namath's white shoes and shaggy hair established him as a trendsetter. So did his prodigious arm. In 1967, Namath became the first quarterback in pro football history to pass for over 4,000 yards in a single season. Namath was brash, but he backed up his boasts with a rocket-launching right arm. I don't know where anybody else's head is. I, I don't know what kind of game they call. I feel I can throw as well or better than anybody. And uh, I think mentally, throwing the football, uh, well, I feel confident I can play better than anybody that's ever played the position. For 12 seasons, Namath's arm was the current that ignited the Jets, and his competitive nature was a rallying point for his teammates. Despite his passing skills, Joe Namath will primarily be remembered for the many roles he played during his glittering career. It was only natural that he would go on to seek fame and fortune in the movies. But no Tinseltown epic could ever equal the real-life saga of Roger Starbuck. It began in a blaze of glory at the Naval Academy. After graduation, Ensign Starbuck served his country. Then, six years later, he touched down in Dallas. During his tour of duty with the Cowboys, he artfully eluded danger with a proficiency that earned him the tag, Roger the Dodger. At first, Starbuck relied on the running ability that helped him win a Heisman Trophy. But this was a man of discipline, and he molded himself into a peerless pocket passer in Tom Landry's imaginative offense. In an era of godfathers and easy riders, Starbuck was a refreshing throwback to old-fashioned, all-American values. Rogers become the prototype, I guess, for the type of 
person that you'd want to have representing you in the National Football League. And I think it, he's a type of person that you want your youngsters looking up to because he, he loves his family. Uh, he's a, a great moral person. He, he's something special to all of us. Here's Gio. It's on two. It's on two. Ready? Break. Hey! Starbuck would become the top-rated quarterback in NFL history, and the Cowboys became the league's most glamorous, thrilling team. During his career, he directed Dallas to 10 consecutive winning seasons and two world championships. Ensign Starbuck attained the rank of Captain Comeback as he generated 23 come-from-behind victories, 14 of them in the final two minutes or in overtime. His resiliency was part of the right stuff that molds a hero. You know, the guy that they call a winner isn't someone that's going to win all the time. But man, when he's down, he's going to bounce back up with everything he has when he gets the chance, and he's going to be down a lot. Starbuck's irrepressible spirit forged a 1975 playoff victory against Minnesota. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle, as we said. Second and ten. Cowboys from the 50. Again, Starbuck has him in the shotgun formation. Roger takes the snap. Pumps it once. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown! What you believe in? They had great faith in him. They never thought they were out of it as long as Roger was throwing the ball. He was something special. Special heroes like Roger Starbuck. Their personal magnetism helped pro football attract cheering men. For over 60 years, men have been devising ways to advance the football. But perhaps the most spectacular and exciting way is through the forward pass. Someone once said, when you put the ball in the air, three things can happen, and two of them are bad, interceptions and incompletions. But passing is and always will be a lethal offensive weapon. Let's face it, the most memorable plays in football history have occurred when the quarterback has gone to the air. 23 to 22 in favor of Cleveland. And the Vikings trail by one, but the crowd has not given up yet. Five seconds left, first down, Cleveland 46. Three wide receivers right, Kramer back to pass. He's going deep, down the right side, and it is fought for, and it's not down! Touchdown! 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 The forward pass, it brings teams from behind. It brings millions to the edge of their seats. And it brings magic to the game. Man was meant to fly. And the first to realize it was Washington Redskin owner George Preston Marshall, a peculiar little showman who signed pro football's first big name quarterback in 1937. Sam Adrian Baugh was a tough, whip-thin passer who brought with him a thick Texas accent and the most accurate passing arm in the game. Baugh polished his passing skills by throwing through peach baskets. Legend has it that long ago, Redskin head coach Ray Flaherty was describing a pass pattern and concluded, when the end cuts here, hit him in the eye with a ball. Just as one would guess, Barr asked, which eye? Barr used the forward pass as a weapon in more ways than one. A boy was rushing me, and he was a good football player. That's what he was supposed to be doing, but he was hitting me with his fist, and as though he was hitting at the ball, he was coming down, and he was always catching me right in the face, and I didn't. At that time, we didn't have any mask on or anything, you know. I told him one time, well, the next time we'd call a pass, I told him not block him, just let him come. Well, I threw the ball and hit him right there on the wet headgear, went across his forehead, and I guess it 
shut off the blood or something. And <laughs> anyway, he he stood there a minute and just fell flat on his. I thought I'd killed him. It scared me more than did him. <laughs> but he did. It didn't help a bit because he still came just as hard next time as, as he did before. Only one passer led the league six times, and once he completed 70 percent in a season. He lasted 16 years, and his name was slinging Sammy Ball. In 1946, a true champion quarterback joined the Cleveland Browns. His name was Otto Graham. I had the good fortune of playing with Otto Graham with the Cleveland Browns in 1948 and 49. And I honestly believe, of all the passers that I've ever seen, and there's been a lot of great ones, and it's tough to define, you know, who was the greatest, but his ability to throw the football at the proper speed and trajectory under the given circumstances was better than anybody I've ever seen. In other words, when he had to just drop the ball in, that ball just floated in there. You couldn't drop the ball. He threw what was known as a soft ball to catch. When he had to drill the ball, boom, he had the ability to do that. Graham's critics claimed that automatic auto was too mechanical. He lacked flamboyance, they said. But one dramatic fact remains. In every season from 1946 to 1955, Otto Graham quarterbacked the Browns to a league or conference championship. Graham used Paul Brown's system to become a winner. Norm Van Brocklin used his own. And if you didn't like it, he'd let you know. They had the most famous temper in the league. There isn't anybody that the Dutchman wouldn't challenge, and there isn't anybody who wouldn't fight if the challenge was accepted. <laughs> he was tough. I recall many times Van Tommy McDonald would say, Dutch, Dutch, throw me the ball, I can beat this guy. And he'd say, shut up, you little runt, keep quiet in this damn huddle. You know, and he'd put him right in their place. Van Brocklin's tongue was sharp, but his game was sharper. In 1951, he took the Rams to the title, once passing for a record 544 yards in a single game. The Dutchman became the first to lead two different teams to a championship, when in 1960, he had what many consider the finest season a quarterback ever had, leading the lowly Eagles to a world title. In 1960, Van Brocklin's arm made the Eagles champion. A year later, another man's mind made the passing attack what it is today. Take a drive corner, Lance, you know, coming in from a good wide position and starting right down that middle and then breaking it off and taking it to the corner. You'll lose him, you'll lose him, you'll lose him. With his one-eyed assistant humming by his side, Sid Gilman experimented like a mad scientist. Inside his brain, a maze of passing formulas emerged. Formulas that made his charges the AFL's most explosive passing team. Well, I believe the father of the modern passing game is Sid Gilman. Sid, I think, was the, really the first man that utilized the rules as they were written. Uh, he found that every receiver was eligible. Sid's formations, his pattern combinations, the utilization of all eligible receivers. Sid put them all together into a passing package, so to speak, and then developed it from there. He looked at the rules of the game and who was eligible and where they could go and utilized every receiver. Sid Gilman and Oakland's Al Davis were to the passing game what Werner von Braun was to rocketry. They were forefathers who took a generation rooted in the ground and launched it into the sky. Men like Dawson, Hadel, LaMonica, and Neyman transformed the blackboard arrows into scoreboard points. But over in the NFL came a phenomenon that lit up the scoreboard and sent opposing coaches back to the blackboard more than any quarterback ever. Fran Tuckett 
was an artistic mutation, a fluke of the times. He scrambled and passed through snow, ice, and sleet. And when he was done, he had thrown more passes and completed more passes for more yards and more touchdowns than any player in history. But in the history of the game, no one utilized the forward pass as expertly and daringly as the man in the high blacks from low rent Pittsburgh. His name was John Unitas. Every time you thought they were going to run, he passed. Every time you thought they were going to pass, they ran. I, I remember calling nine different defenses against him when I was playing with the Washington Redskins. He beat all nine of them. So I got in a huddle and I said, does anybody have any recommendations? Not a guy open her mouth. Unitas brought to his position the quality a great actor brings to a great part. Clark Gable playing Rhett Butler, Earl Flynn playing Robin Hood. He put together a string of 47 consecutive NFL games in which he threw a touchdown pass, more than doubling the record. More than a quarterback, he was a leader, and it was his character rather than his ability that set John Unitas apart from the rest. I have to believe that he was beyond intimidation. I remember vividly a game in 1960 with the Chicago Bears with just seconds left on the clock and the, Blairs, the Bears put on one of those uh, violent blitzes that they were noted for. Uh, Unitas is, uh, was bleeding from two or three places on his face. There was about a five minute referee timeout while they repaired Unitas and uh, the Bears were right six yards away looking at this man and knew that he was in, in dreadful straits as far as being in a physical way. His face was battered and torn. His nose was, was, was bleeding. He had one eye above the eye, was torn and, and cut. And they patched him up as best they could. There was like 48 seconds left on the clock. And John had one more shot in the gun and raised it and hit Lenny Moore for six. I'll never forget the reaction of the crowd. The crowd couldn't believe it. There were at least 3,000 spectators waiting outside Wrigley Field. And I've never, ever seen it after any athletic event. And I've been a sports writer for over 30 years where the crowd waited to just see what manner of man is this. And as Unitas went through the crowd, they were just there to, to revere him and to look at him. From Slingin' Sam to Johnny Yu to Joe Montana, each has proved time after time that indeed the most memorable plays in pro football history have occurred when the quarterback has gone to the end. 58 seconds remaining at the six-yard line of the Dallas Cowboys. Everything hangs in the balance now. The season, the outcome of a Super Bowl berth hangs in the balance. He has the ball. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass. Caught by Clark. Clark got a touchdown. Clark, Clark has it. It's a touchdown for the 49ers. Conditions were not exactly first class in the 1950s. In locker rooms like this one, pro football players prepared themselves for games that were like atomic wars. There were no winners, only survivors. Hi, I'm Chuck Benarek, and I played for the Philadelphia Eagles in the 1950s, years that were called the golden age of pro football. Pros like myself played football, not for money or glory, but for the simplest reason the love of the game. The fabulous 50s, the Eisenhower years. A period when people took life and each other a little less seriously. A decade where the vision of America was tinted with optimism. Nowhere was this image clearer than in pro football. It was heroic, romantic, and nostalgic the purest form of sport. Pro football became the new national obsession and burst into full flower in the 50s. 
For nostalgia buffs, the 50s meant fire wagon football, a merry-go-round of big plays, a circus of carefree and colorful performers. It was filled with magic moments and magical players. One half of pro football's all-time team played in this decade. Pro football in the 50s was not stylized or synchronized, but a wild game. A highlight film with all the penalties and mistakes left in. At the top, pro football bubbled like soda pop, effervescent and sweet. But beneath the surface, the game had a harsh, bitter taste. It was a rough, violent, often brutal sport. And you get into that sort of a cannibalistic feeling. All you want to do is go out there and, like I say, you just want to kill somebody. I want to get them, I'm going to kill them. Not mean you are, you're going to put them in the ground after, but you just want to kill a guy, boy. You, you, you actually froth from the mouth and you're going to really put it to them. In the 50s, the meek did not inherit this turf. There were bitter rivalries between teams and fierce grudges between players. One that fested for years concerned the Rams' Deacon Dan Towler and the Colts' Art Donovan. I said, let's get Deacon Dan. That was our time. He said, fine. So here comes the, the Rams out of huddle. Van Vakken was a quarterback. He hands fake hand off to Deacon Dan. He comes into the line. They pitch the ball out to a halfback. And Finn and I got Deacon Dan down on the ground. We we're really going at him. So the official grabs us. He says, if you guys do that again, it's going to cost you 100 bucks. I'm going to throw you out of the game. We didn't know that Deacon Dan, he ran off the field. And they put the other fullback in named Tank Younger. And they both look alike. Uh, they were six foot three, 240 pounds. They're both black. So unless you knew the number, you didn't know how they were. Same play again. We got him down on the ground. Now, I got his nose. And I'm trying to pull his nose off his face. And Finnan's finish banging on the back of the neck. So all of a sudden, from underneath the park comes, hey, he says, leave me go. He says, this ain't the Deak. It's the Tank. We had the wrong guy. Players like Art Donovan could find something funny in a broken leg. They were undeniably violent, certifiably tough. I lost six teeth on one play when I blocked the punt. He kicked me in the teeth and uh, knocked all my teeth out. And I vividly remember that because I was looking on the ground for my teeth. And, when I'm, and everyone was yelling, get in the huddle, Bob. You know, it wasn't get off the field, Bob. You know, get in the huddle. We, we, we don't want to call a timeout. Number 79, Bob St. Clair of the 49ers had a caveman aura, but he was no brainless brute. At six foot nine, 270 pounds, he was a massive blocking machine. St. Clair credited his great strength to eating raw meat, an eccentricity which earned him the nickname, the geek. We used to go out and shoot doves, and it was all illegal, you know, in season and so forth. And uh, I would, would take uh, the doves, and uh, I remember one day, we had, I had about 12, uh, well, maybe more than that, uh, 12, 15 doves. And we were plucking them and cleaning them, and I would take the heart, you know, and I was making a little pile of dove hearts over here in the corner. And then this, this uh, kid from Nebraska came, Omaha, and came over and said, uh, what are you doing with that pile of hearts? And I said, why, I'm going to eat them. That's why I put them over there. And he said, what are you going to have, make some kind of a sauce? I said, sauce? No, 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 these are real good this way here. You see these? And I put two in my mouth and was chewing on them and looking at them. And I thought he, was, he turned three different colors. I thought he was going to faint right there. He ran out of there. I'm sure that he would call back to his girlfriend or his wife or his mother or something in, in Omaha and say, there are cannibals out here. <laughs> The 1950s produced the most outlandish cast of characters in pro football history. A witch's brew of monsters, mavericks, and magicians. The most colorful team in the league was the Detroit Lions, a riotous bunch of revelers who loved wine, women, and song. Their party shaper was quarterback Bobby Lay. One time we passed him at halftime, coming out for the second half in Baltimore. I said, Bobby, how you doing? He breathed on me. I said, 
Jesus, is that from last night? He said, I had a couple at halftime. So, you know, he was a character, but a great football player, tough guy. This blonde, slightly pudgy Texan played football and lived life in flamboyant style. In a city of working men, number 22 was a workmanlike quarterback who appeared to do nothing right except win. I did do some things that uh, I do regret now. Uh, I did, uh, I, as I always said, I went in the front door. I didn't sneak <laughs> in the back door. It hurt my family some. That's the only thing, the publicity. Everybody knew me in Detroit, and I couldn't go anywhere without some conversation. A teammate once said, when Bobby said block, you blocked. When he said drink, you drank. Lane and the Lions typified a sense of adventure, something that transcends statistics, a flair that endures in the memory. Hit him? He didn't care. Play without a face mask. And then you really went after him. Three of us hit him at one time, and they all hollered, watch out, Bobby, here they come. And when he got him back in the offensive huddle, he kicked two of them. He kicked Creekman right in the legs. He was so mad at Creekman for missing Marchetti, he kicked him right in the shins. Creekman stood there and took it. Bobby was hot-headed and explosive. He played full tilt every moment and expected his teammates to do the same. Under his whip, the Lions won four Western Conference titles, two NFL championships, and became more important to Detroit than General Motors. While the Lions were consistently of championship caliber, other teams also shaped the history of the 50s. The Los Angeles Rams dominated the early years with a glamorous team that possessed more skilled players than any team of the decade. The Rams rang up points like a pinball machine, and the results of their games read like old-time basketball scores. In 1956, George Hallis's Chicago Bears were primed to win a title with their bruising style of play. But 1956 belonged to number 42 quarterback Charlie Connolly, who passed the New York Giants to an NFL championship. All across the 50s stretched the shadow of the most dominant team, the Cleveland Browns. In 10 years, the dynasty created by Paul Brown captured seven Eastern Conference crowns and three NFL championships. While the Browns were a model of excellence, a history of failure had marked the Baltimore Colts. The 50s Colts were victims of bad breeding sired by the sad sack Colts of the late 40s and the dreadful Dallas Texans of 1952, these Colts were a bad seed. They were a collection of oddballs, a team with little character, but many characters. Don Colo, Sister Averna, Y.A. Till and myself, we were roommates. So we had a big shower in this big bathroom, and we locked the shower stall door, and we filled up the shower all the way up to maybe about six foot. And we went over the top from the glass, and we're in the four of us are in there. We're all, you know, bear, uh, swimming around, having a good time, and somebody hit the latch, and the damn door opens up, and maybe 100 gallons of water goes all over our floor and down the next apartment house, and the ceiling caved in. And you know how to pay for it. Tittle, we didn't have any money. And he was the only guy making any money. And from that day, he would never speak to us, really. He was tied in a clan with Lodgejaw. Head coach Weeb Eubank rebuilt this laughing stock of a team by drafting sure shots or taking chances on obscure college players. Tackling fullback Alan Amici, number 35, proved harder than knocking a tank off its tracks. And there was no defense against the acrobatics of Raymond Barry. The Pony Express began to roll in earnest when a racehorse named Lenny Moore became their number one draft choice. 
Wild number 24 added a new dimension to the offense. It was another eager rookie that made the dramatic difference. Johnny Unitas transformed himself from a $6 a day sandlot player into an NFL quarterback and transformed the Colts from chumps into champions. We had a football team that, you know, laughed together, played together, uh, lived together, liked each other. It was a rare combination of personalities and talents, and uh, I think the Colt team in those years was the best place in the world to be. Great ownership, great leadership, and great players. Baltimore won an NFL championship in 1958, and again in 1959, when they defeated the New York Giants. This marvelous team, which included seven Hall of Fame members, crushed the Giants 31 to 16 to close out the decade. By the turn of the decade, pro football became part of the American culture, and the fabulous 50s will be remembered fondly for those monsters, mavericks, and magicians who played their sport with abandon, with delight, and with a touch of class. Pro football has come a long way since the days of Red Grange, but in many ways, the game has hardly changed at all. Vince Lombardi may have stated it best. He said football was first and foremost a running game. Coach Lombardi was right. The run remains the game's most basic weapon. A long run, well, it entails all the things that the game is about. But the fascination doesn't lie in the strategy of running the ball, but rather with the artistry and elegance that go into it. Watching a man run with a football can be a beautiful sight. You are witnessing an expression of style so intensely personal that no two men do it alike. Running to daylight is an art form, one that counts as many variations on a theme as there are runs. In the 1950s, Hugh McElhenney introduced a style unlike any that had come before. The man they called the King ran all over the field in pursuit of the goal line. With his open field excursions, McElhenney generated an electricity previously reserved for politicians and movie stars. A decade later, Gail Sayers outdid even the Magnetic King as the most sensational running stylist of any period. Gail Sayers was an insane runner. You know when he was running the ball, you wouldn't even look at the guy who was immediately in front of him because you knew that guy was history. You'd be looking at the guys who were coming up on angles on him because he was, I mean, he was always running so far ahead of the immediate guys around him. It was incredible. Although Sayers and McElhenney expanded the dimensions of the runner, they were merely branches in the evolutionary tree. The roots were planted in the 1940s with Marion Motley and Steve Van Buren. Van Buren, number 15, was the bridge from the early days to the modern. He showed beyond any doubt that a runner could be the main weapon in a pro offense. Motley, at 240 pounds, was the first big back with a speed to outrun defenses. He certified that fullbacks could be more than punishing brutes. Dominant fullbacks characterized two of the NFL's greatest teams. 
In the 1960s, Jim Taylor powered Green Bay to four championships. The 70s produced four Super Bowl titles for Franco Harris and the Steelers. Consistency and durability distinguish Harris's 11-year career, but for quality over an extended period, no back can touch Joe Perry. Perry spanned three decades, from the 40s to the 60s. As an undersized fullback, he was neither powerful nor deceptive. He simply had great speed. Another speedster helped make the 50s a decade of change. Number 33, Ollie Matson, an Olympic gold medalist, added versatility to the role of a running back. Excelling in all facets of offensive play, Matson's talents could be so overwhelming that the Los Angeles Rams traded nine players just to get him. Matson's all-around skills and McElhenney's elusiveness marked the 50s. The 60s saw Sayre's brilliance, and in 1972, the NFL witnessed the coming out of O.J. Simpson. The great running back will run uh, two or three players beyond the immediate player, especially in broken field situations. And as I said, it's, uh, I don't know if you call it ESP or what, I used to say I've reached that state of clear. I used to turn the reds and say I'm there. I can see everything, just give me the ball I want to go. A world-class sprinter, Simpson's speed was matched by his instinctive ability to change direction. The NFL's premier runner in the 70s, the juice, was the target of all who faced him. And we figured out scientifically, without any prejudice, who's going to win the ball game. The Steelers are going to win because they're hungry. They didn't have no breakfast today. They've been waiting for the juice! <laughs> No defense could touch the juice. And in 1973, Simpson ascended to a level of greatness previously unthinkable. O.J. running left. O.J. five more. There it is. They did it. They did it. Yeah. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season. That last game was not quite over, and I went into the locker room. I've never felt like that. I can't recall feeling like that any other time in professional football. Simpson inaugurated a new era. Peyton, Dorsett, and Campbell followed. Walter Peyton embodies all styles. He is at once swift, elusive, and physical. Walter has two qualities that you don't really have in one running back normally. He has great speed, but not only is that, he has great strength for his size. Not only do you have to plug the hole up, but you got to plug the hole up twice, you know, because he's going to run through you, he's going to run through your tacklers. So when you combine that kind of strength with good balance and great running ability, then you've got to have a premier running back. I don't think any question that Walter Payton's the best in our business today. That same claim may be made on behalf of Earl Campbell. Campbell, like Peyton, runs over people. In 
In 1980, he joined Simpson as the only other back in NFL history to surpass 1,900 yards in a season. No small back in football can touch Tony Dorsett. At 185 pounds, Dorsett possesses lightning acceleration and an extraordinary move. He'll go in the hole and he'll, right when he makes contact with a guy, he'll spin. He'll just spin right around. It's almost like watching a Earl of Pearl Monroe with a basketball. Dorsett, Campbell, and Peyton each deserving of a place among the NFL's greatest backs. But to find the best, you have to return to the 1950s. Jimmy Brown was, without a doubt, the greatest football player to ever put on a uniform. I mean, he could just do everything with it. And uh, uh, when you talk about tough, he was just tough because he was such a great talent that he could, he could run with that football. <laughs> Jim Brown played nine seasons with the Cleveland Browns, leading the NFL in rushing in eight of them. He is the only man to average more than 100 yards per game for every game he played. <laughs> Nearly 20 years after his retirement, Jim Brown still has gained more yards and scored more touchdowns than any other runner in NFL history. When we drafted him, I, I thought he was going to be a great back. It turns out that, for my money, he's the greatest running back of all time. He recognized my talent, recognized my speed and quickness. And after one exhibition game, he decided I was his uh, fullback. He told me that. And he must have knew a little bit about me because that was what really inspired me. All he had to do was tell me that I was his man and I would then do the rest of the work. I played nine seasons, I never missed a game. And I never laid out on the football field. Guys now accept the fact that they can be hurt slightly, run off the field, get themselves together and come back. I might not have the greatest ability of everybody, but the one thing that stands is that when it was time to play, I was there. As pro football strides resolutely into the 80s, Jim Brown remains the greatest runner in NFL history. In the history of professional football, there's never been another job quite like head coach. I think after all these years, Mike, that I could come out here and be nice and relaxed. Jeez, I'm a nervous wreck. Since the game began, he has been the man behind the men, a spectator to his own fate. Mouth at 20, you couldn't cover me. <laughs> A few head coaches are legends for what they have given to the game and for their ability to win. Everybody's grabbing out there, nobody tackling. Just grabbing, everybody. Grab, grab, grab. Most, however, never become more than the answers to obscure trivia questions. Gonna do every time they get the ball, they're gonna score here. Can you somebody do something? This fascinating assortment of tyrants, technicians, and teachers all share a common curse and blessing. You're only as good as your last game. If we die, we die together. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. Most are motivators, but only a few head coaches are innovators. Slot reverse right, fake 23. Perhaps the greatest was Paul Brown. His use of academic discipline enabled his Cleveland Browns to win the NFL championship in their very first year in the league in 1950. 
no other man has to his credit so many improvements in planning, equipping, and teaching. And most of his waking hours were spent devising new stratagems for the game he loved. Well, he had always called plays by alternating offensive guards. Then he got the idea to put a radio in the quarterback's helmet. And first time we tried that was in a preseason game in Akron, Ohio, against Detroit, I believe. And pouring down rain, lightning all over the place, and I figure I got this lightning rod built into my head gear here, you know, and I didn't know whether I was going to make it through the game or not. And you felt like an idiot with the thing because it was an antenna and you would have to turn like that. So I'd have to stand outside the huddle going like this, you know, until he came in loud and clear. Over 40 of his former players or assistants have perpetuated Paul Brown's coaching influence. One was number 65, former messenger guard Chuck Knoll. As head coach of the Steelers, Knoll was the first to win four Super Bowls, while another former player, Don Shula, led the Dolphins to an undefeated season in 1972. Weeb Eubank taught the pro-passing game to Baltimore's John Unitas and New York superstar Joe Namath. He was also the only coach to win a championship in both the American and National Leagues. Weeb, I think a lot of times would rather have a good way in than win the ball game on Sunday. This is, he was fanatical about the weights, you see. And he'd always on Friday after we'd weigh in, he said, well, I haven't had a chance to digest all the weights, but he knew who was over, you know. Uh, Weeb was the type of guy, that he was a spy in the Second World War, we'd never have to worry about Russia. He would have screwed Russia up so bad, they would have surrendered, or the Germans would have surrendered before we even got across the English Channel. I really mean it. If Eubank was a spy, then George Hallis was the game's five-star general. One of the first head coaches, starting in 1920, Hallis led his Chicago Bears for 40 years easily the NFL's longest tenure. Hallis schemed, raged, and plotted a course for his club and professional football. He was the Papa Bear, and no other team so clearly reflected the personality of its head coach. Here comes a knock on the door in the trainer's room, and it's Papa Bear. And the equipment man answers, it, answers the uh, door he said, yes, coach, can I help you? He says, yes, I'd like to speak to Coach Lombardi. It's very urgent. Now, this is five minutes before the game, and he walks in, and here are the two coaches by themselves. He says, yes, coach, can I help you? And he says, yeah. He said, Vince, I just want you to know you better have your team ready because we're going to kick your ass. George Hallis is the NFL without any question. Hallis won his first NFL championship when Woodrow Wilson was president. His last, when Lyndon Johnson was in office, seven in all. He was also an inventive technician whose most influential brainchild was the alignment that led pro football into a new era. The age of the T formation. In the 1940 championship against Washington, Chicago's T formation created the most lopsided win in NFL history. Hallis's T spread out and opened up a game previously dominated by defense. Defensive strength had first been emphasized by New York Giant head coach Steve Owen during the 1930s. Two decades later in 1958, the Giants won three straight games without scoring a touchdown. All of a sudden, the people were booing the offensive team because they, they weren't doing anything. And so, in order to keep the offensive team from getting booed, they started introducing us from the defensive unit. And 63,000 fans gave us standing ovations. So it caught on around the National Football League that the defensive team got their due credit. The architect of this defense was a young assistant coach named Tom Landry. I guess my background was such that I was kind of analytical. I had an industrial engineering degree, and everything I saw was really in, in uh, coordinating people. When I became the player coach of the, of the Giants in 54, we went completely to the 4-3 defense. And from that time on, we tried to perfect 4-3 defense. Landry's 4-3 revolutionized modern defense. And when he moved on to become the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, he designed many multiple offensive schemes, 
to undo the defensive principles he had pioneered. Landry's scholarly and unemotional approach to an intense game is but a mask, hiding a determined will to win. For Tom Landry and all the other members of his profession, game day is filled with frustration. All right, out of bounds. Oh, no! Oh, no! The hell's a white line for? Hey, Ayman! Hey, you over-officious jerk! My daughter could do better! My daughter could! You're chicken! You guys made an error there. That was a lateral from upstairs. We didn't see it either, but it was a lateral, that last pass. Oh, no! That was on the ground! That was on the ground! Oh, They're killing me, Whitey! They're killing me! Douglas! Douglas! You go back in the game till I tell you to. Understand, Harmon? You're, you're in the big leagues now. You understand? Yes, sir. Well, let's start growing up. Get out of bounds, Speedy. Out of bounds, you stupid guy! God almighty! Why do we do that? God almighty! Sorry, I can't believe it! You all ought to be ashamed of yourself. Shit, you gotta get out there and you gotta block, you gotta tackle, you gotta cover, you gotta protect. That's a rotten exhibition of football. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You deserve the booze they give you. The first rule of coaching is to win. The pressures can tear a good man apart. There are so many ways to fail. And a head coach must accept absolute responsibility for them all. In 1959, the Green Bay Packers hired a man who would turn a crew of losers into a romantic team of legends. After 20 years of being an assistant, Vince Lombardi had become fascinated with the intricacies of how an X on a blackboard became a human being on the field. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. Dark take, hands to Taylor. Sweep to the left side, he's got the block, he's at the five, cuts into the end zone for the touchdown. He was a man whose presence changed other men. When the Packers won their very first game under Lombardi, they started a post-game ritual that would last for nearly a decade. We were so elated and so excited to having won this first game for our new coach that we just sort of swooped him up on our shoulder. In a sense, Lombardi never touched the ground again. In nine years, Lombardi's Packers won 99 games, six conference titles, and five NFL championships. Despite this success, neither he nor his team of famous names and faces ever lost their appetite for achievement. A lot of people say that Vince Lombardi doesn't like to lose. Well, of course I don't. Anybody who has the idea that just to play or just to take part, and that's all that's necessary, I think he's in the wrong business. I think championships are there to be won. You should win as many as you can, and every time you go out there, you should try to win. Out of double inch and three. Supposed to be a hell of a defensive club, but didn't look like it to me. All the way down, about 70 yards. Vince Lombardi never coached a losing team, and few equaled his ability to motivate. Every single day, he would talk for five to ten minutes. And it was fantastic every single day. Here we go here. He would motivate you every single day of your life. I want you to be proud of your profession. It's a great profession. You'd be proud of this game. And you can do a great deal for football today. Great deal for all the players in the league and everything else. Go out there and play this ball game like I know you can play it. Lombardi, 
The name itself speaks of duels in the mud and snow, of a simple, basic approach to football executed perfectly. It was said that there was no magic in Lombardi's methods. That may have been true, but there certainly was magic in the way his team performed for him. Beneath his stormy surface flowed a warm tide of compassion and concern for his players that brought out the best they could get. After winning the first two Super Bowls, Vincent T. Lombardi died of cancer in 1970. In memoriam, the National Football League named its ultimate prize, the Super Bowl trophy, after him. It was a fitting tribute. Emblematic of the pinnacle that head coaches have sought to climb throughout the history of professional football. Individual stars come and go in professional football, but team achievements endure through the ages. For 40 years, the Pittsburgh Steelers were the NFL's least successful football team. But in the 70s, as you can see, all that changed. Many things go into the making of a championship football team, but for the truly great teams, history's finest, they all had that special ingredient that collective will to win that set them apart from all the rest. In Pittsburgh, that will to win was what gave our defense its distinct personality. Left, left, sprint left! In a word, we were intimidating. Winning through intimidation, a formula that served the Pittsburgh Steelers well. Of course, intimidation is nothing new to pro football. Under George Hallis, the Chicago Bears won eight world championships with the most fundamental methods. They intimidated teams. And when I say intimidate, that means make you quit. They intimidated you. And of course, you had somebody on the sideline too, by the name of George Hallis, and he intimidated everybody. The other players, he intimidated the officials, and that's the kind of a team it was. They played football with a flair. I mean, maybe it's Mr. Hallis's flair of uh, bullying you a little bit, but the game was colorful. Hallis's Bear teams were called many things. Colorful is the mildest of descriptions. I don't think Hollis really cared whether he won or lost as whether he hurt the other team. We'd get to the stadium. I remember one time we pulled up in front of uh, Wrigley Field and uh, we were on a bus and, and, and the Bears had a guy, a defensive left tackle named John Creamcheck. And he looked like a, like, a, like a hobo, like he just got off a freight train. And he was a mean looking guy. He had hair growing out of his nose inside and outside. And he had bushy hair. I mean, he looked like a Neanderthal man. And he's standing out there before the game with the newspaper guy. And he's warming his hands over the fire in a, in a, like they had a barrel there. And Weeb Eubanks looks at him and he says, look at him, look at him. Look at that big, dirty, ugly looking bum. He says, he don't throw no chillin' to me. And George Prees, who had to play against him, said, well, God damn it, Weeb, you don't have to play against him. And we went out and they killed us. <laughs> George Hallis's Monsters of the Midway, one of history's finest teams, and always very colorful. Only one NFL city has celebrated more world championships than Chicago. A small town in northern Wisconsin, famous for meat packing and toilet paper, as well as ungodly cold winter days. In December of 67, on the coldest day in NFL history, 
the hardy citizens of Green Bay, Wisconsin, watched their Packers do what no team had ever done. Bart Starr coming over to check with Coach Vince Lombardi. 20 seconds remaining in this football game. The Packers inches away from something that has never before happened in pro football history. A third straight NFL championship. The Packers come out of the huddle. Starr begins to count. Takes the snap. He's got the quarterback. He's in for the touchdown. The Packers are out in front. And the Green Bay Packers are going to be NFL champions for the third straight year. The Green Bay Packers went on to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. In the early 70s, Don Shula's Miami Dolphins equaled that feat and along the way accomplished something even the Packers hadn't done. With machine-like precision, the Dolphins powered through the 1972 regular season undefeated. A pair of playoff victories put Miami in the Super Bowl. And there, in January of 1973, they became the only team in NFL history to finish a season undefeated and untied. Don Shooter's Miami Dolphins achieved perfection. But before the decade was over, another Florida team would do likewise. Of course, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' perfect season was anything but. So inept were the 1976 Bucks that even head coach John McKay voiced his amusement. Boy, well, these guys are almost gutless, and the ones that aren't that are brainless. We have to kick a damn extra point if we get in there. We haven't made one yet. We haven't even blocked anybody yet. The 1976 Bucks were the only team in modern history to lose all their games. And blocking was not their only problem. You can't stop a pass or a run. It was in great shape. So a hell of a lot of careers going in Monday. In marked contrast to Tampa Bay's ineptitude was the consistent excellence of Tom Landry's Dallas Cowboys. In Dallas, superior athletes execute innovative designs. From computerized scouting to choreographed half times, no team has launched so many innovations. And for the last two decades, Precious few have been more successful. They have been called America's team. And since the mid-60s, only one other team in America has won more often. The Raiders. Pro football's black sheep. The Raiders' stranglehold on success is due to many things, one of them being toughness. Another Raider trademark is their ability to win games in the final seconds, just as they did against the defending world champion Miami Dolphins in the 1974 AFC Championship. A classic Raider comeback. There he is, fading, looking, looking, looking. He's under the gun. He's fired, he throws. It is. Oh, he caught it, he caught it. He caught it. Unbelievable. When the Oakland Raiders beat the Dolphins that day, a lot of people labeled that game the real Super Bowl, meaning that with Miami out of the way, the Raiders would coast to the World Championship. But the following week, they had to play us. During the week, 
Coach Noel came into a team meeting and he did something completely out of character for him. He said he just wanted to set the record straight. He said that the people in Oakland and the world thought that the best team in the NFL was in Oakland. He said, I want you guys to know that the best damn team in football is sitting right here in this room. We live with Chuck's words the rest of the week, and it affected every member of our football team. That Sunday in Oakland, there was no way we were going to lose. Pittsburgh Steelers were on their way to becoming the team of the decade. Steeler coach Chuck Noll believes in drafting the best athletes of ever. And at times during the 1970s, it appeared Noll had acquired them all. At no time were Pittsburgh's intense performances more brilliant than in Super Bowl competition where they won an unprecedented four times in six years. The greatest teams, the wildest dreams, the legends, the heroes, the names. Runners with style. Passers with guile. Coaches who led them to fame. Yes, each gave his all to pro football. To make it the greatest of games.